Mark Rogers TV, the voice of college football, breaking down the game we love with the best bloggers, broadcasters, and writers in the nation. We encourage you to help us build the channel. You can grab the Amazon link in the description section below. Just do your Amazon shopping using that link. Doesn't cost you an extra penny. You don't have to buy the product. Just use the link. We are making our stop at UCF, and uh, here in future months, we're going to prep you uh, for August camp with our position previews with Jeff Sharon from uh, Black and Gold Banneret. Right now, our final fun topic off-season. Let's let it fly. Uh, talk about um, not necessarily the realistic, but uh, what's happened in the past, the historical, and then kind of transitioning, Jeff, to uh, what you would like to see happen. So our fun questions begin with the best wins in program history. And so I'm going to let you structure the framework of the time frame, whether that's all time, all time, all time, or since you've been covering and watching, and uh, I'll let you take it from there in regards to what hits you as the best wins, uh, the most impactful wins for you in UCF history or your time reference. I'm, I'm so glad to actually do this because I think that you know, a lot of, a lot of the college football national audience out there kind of, you know, kind of sees UCF as a Johnny come lately. And the fact is this program has spent, uh, has really come up from the bottom and, and I'll give you, and this is a perfect question to answer. You got to remember that UCF started as a, as a university in 1963 the football program started in 1979, and they started as a Division Three independent in 79. They moved up to Division Two a few years later, finally moved up to uh, back then 1AA, now FCS, in the late 80s. And the first, but there, I, I really think of there were three, actually four big wins, of the biggest wins in school history. The first one was in 1990. UCF was in the um, FCS playoffs, uh, and uh, and they and were a relative newcomer. I think they'd only been there for a year or two, and they but they reached the playoffs and they go to Youngstown State. Youngstown State, as uh, I'm sure you and your audience know, at, especially at that time, was an FCS power year in and year out. They were like what Alabama is now in FBS, and UCF and they were coached at the time by Jim Tressel. And UCF goes up there and beats them 20 to 17 on a, on a field goal with no time left. They made it to the semifinals that year, lost in the semifinals. But that was the first big, huge win for UCF as a football program was in FCS in 1990. And you can speak, you know, to speak to how good those Youngstown State schools were in FCS at that time, right? Absolutely. So Jim Tressel took over there. I don't want to botch the dates, but it was sometime in the early to mid 80s. But he had a run from uh, the time of about 1985 until he took the Ohio State job in 2001 of winning. Uh, I, I don't remember the exact number. I don't follow FCS football, but I lived about an bunch. hour away <laughs> at the point. So we certainly heard a ton about it. But uh, yeah, he was dominant uh, there at Youngstown State. So that was the first one. In uh, so UCF moves up to D1A finally in 19 uh, around in the in the mid to late 90s 1996. Dante Culpepper comes in 1998. He graduated in 1998. But UCF was still an independent, and they failed to make a bowl game in in uh, 98. And what was their best season? They went nine and two and missed a bowl game. Um, the following year, UCF goes to Alabama, 1999. So this was pre Saban. Alabama. And it's see every year to that point, UCF, we used to call it UCF because UCF had played multiple games as an independent against SEC, ACC, some Big Ten, Big East opponents. And every we would go there on like a homecoming date, right? And and UCF would find a way somehow to lose a game. There's a game where they had a first and first and ten inside the Auburn 15 in the final two minutes up late in the game and found a way to lose it. They lost a game at Georgia on a very controversial penalty. It was just year after year after year, heartbreak after heartbreak. Couldn't get the big win. Finally, in 1999, UCF goes up to Tuscaloosa and beats Alabama 40-38 to on, a, again, another late field goal by Javier Berlegi. And uh, you can catch that, that final field goal on YouTube. That was the win that 
UCF fans feel put the Knights back then, they were called the Golden Knights, on the map in terms of college football and being a competitive college football team. Um, and of course, UCF fans love to hold that over Alabama fans' head when they talk about head to heads um, with Alabama, especially over the last um, couple of years. So a few years later, um, UCF ceases being an independent. They joined the MAC for a couple of years. Jar George O'Leary comes in, um, and then UCF moves up to uh, Conference USA. The Knights win a couple of conference titles, but um, <clears throat> including 2007 when Kevin Smith um, ran for 2,500 yards, which was a great year, um, and UCF won their first conference title. In 2013, UCF finally gets the invitation to the big leagues to join what at the time was the Big East. And then the Big East kind of <clears throat> imploded underneath them and became the American Athletic Conference. In 2013, UCF's first year in that league was the last year of the BCS era when that conference held an automatic bid to those, uh, to the, at that time, the BCS bowl games, what we now know as the New Year's Six. So UCF that year goes to Louisville on a Friday night. Uh, Charlie Strong was coaching Louisville in 2013, and everyone was expecting Louisville to be, to go undefeated, be the Big East representative in the BCS, maybe make a run at the national championship. UCF falls down big in that game early, but fights their way back. And on a late touchdown pass in the final moments, a great drive by Blake Bortles. He found a former quarterback turned wide receiver, Jeff Godfrey, in the end zone. And UCF beat Louisville 38-35. Um, and that was the springboard for their 2013 season where they went 12-1, and beat Baylor 52-42 in the Fiesta Bowl. That was another huge win. So 2013, big-time conference win. And now we can see the only loss that year was to Steve Spurrier in South Carolina at home by three points. And that was the year that everyone thought, okay, we really do have something. And then I would say for my last win, uh, last big win in the history of the program, and we've seen a lot of them over the last few years, 25 wins in a row. But uh, two years ago, that uh, Peach Bowl win over Auburn, um, to seal up the undefeated season with Scott Frost having already announced that he was leaving uh, UCF for Nebraska. Uh, they go out in that game. It, it seemed like every alumnus for UCF was in Mercedes-Benz Stadium um, that day. They completely took over the stadium, and it was just the grand coming out party for UCF saying, we are one of the big boys knocking off Auburn 34-27 in that peach bowl. It was, uh, and I was there actually at the game and, and there was something really special about that because those of us who came to UCF, like I did in 2001 to 2005, when they were an independent and into the Mac kind of saw what the potential was, but never really thought we'd see the day. And then one day, the day, the day comes and I was there with my son and he was three at the time. And there was a, there was a feeling among a lot of us who were, who were from, who, came up with UCF in that era when they were making that transition from, you know, a, a barely a D1 FBS program to a major program in college football that, you know, that UCF had arrived and that we were sort of passing and, and look at how far it's come. So um, those are the four big wins. I would say call it the Mount Rushmore, if you will, of UCF wins all time. You're bringing back memories for me, Jeff. Um, and it's astonishing. I'm looking at the game scores to think, as you outline very eloquently, that not just starting football in 1979, but the the really big leap from my perspective is going from FCS to independent status uh, as a major player. And these schedules, yes, there are gaps in the schedule where there's going to be an Idaho or a Samford or a really bad Mac team. But other than that, Six to eight uh, games on these schedules in the mid to late 90s are serious, serious yeah. opponents week after week after week, as you mentioned, mostly in the SEC. And uh, so I remember in 1997, I was covering college football in Mississippi, and my primary focus was the University of Alabama, Ole Miss, and Mississippi State. We were right in the middle of them. I was working at a CBS station. Mm -hmm. And right out of the gate in week one, 
there was a 24-23 loss by Central Florida against Ole Miss. Yeah. So that was one of the many near misses that uh, you're alluding to. A pretty good Ole Miss team that went to a, a bowl game and won a bowl game against Randy Moss and company at Marshall. Mm -hmm. uh, so from my perspective in covering major college football in the SEC and the Power Five and, and whatever they were termed at the time, Central Florida might as well have been VMI or Samford or somebody else. Uh, I quickly found out different. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, this that, pit, Dante Culpepper came to town and uh, in prepping for that particular game. And then later in the season, Mississippi State, we learned that Dante Culpepper was a major NFL prospect. And then we saw it on the field where he nearly pulled out the game against Ole Miss 24, 23. And then about seven or eight weeks later, they come to Starkville again. And I remember standing in the back of the end zone, watching most of the game from that perspective, right up and close and personal and seeing these passing skill from this kid and his athleticism and size and seeing SEC defenders bounce off of him. And uh, they had a shootout in Starkville against Mississippi State Bulldogs won at 35, 28. So I quickly gained respect for Central Florida and the talent that they were bringing in at that time to be able to play. And I'm going through the year after year after year, you're hitting the highlights, but I'm seeing multiple dozens of games against the likes of Arkansas, South Carolina, Auburn, as you mentioned. And sure, there was a few blowouts in there. Uh, we're talking the best conference in the country. Uh, but most of the games were extremely competitive. Yeah. And just that one year in particular, 1997, you talked about the Ole Miss game in the opener. And then the Mississippi State game was on October the 25th. Okay, after that Ole Miss game, still early September, they go to South Carolina and lose 33-31. The next week, they go to Nebraska, a team that would eventually win the national championship, quarterbacked by Scott Frost. UCF actually led the game at halftime in Lincoln and fell 38-24. to 24. Jeff, how many teams did Nebraska bury that were Power 5 major conference teams just obliterate that season, oh. and they only beat Central Florida by two touchdowns? Well, the next week they 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 – what went up to uh, Husky Stadium in Seattle and blasted around Washington, who was then number two by uh, two touchdowns. They put 56 on then number 17, Kansas State. I'm just going down the line. They uh, In conference play, they gave up a total of seven points over three weeks playing Texas Tech, Kansas, and Oklahoma. <laughs> uh, they dropped 77 on Iowa State. Um, wow. and, then, and then to cap it all off, that same season, they dropped – 42 on Peyton Manning in Tennessee in the Orange Bowl uh, to seal up a uh, to seal up a share that year of the national championship uh, um, with Lincoln. Um, that was a heck of a Huskers team that UCF went toe to toe with in Lincoln that year. Absolutely, it's astonishing. Again, so we appreciate the recap on Central Florida's. Um, Biggest wins, most impactful wins in history, and uh, appreciate the synopsis there.